So just list your Bibles and say with me now, Father God in heaven, let your word fill my mind. Let your word be in my heart. And let your word be on my lips. And let your grace show in my life. Amen and amen. So, what's Paul saying here? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and it's from verse 1 to 11. It's quite a long section. And he starts off, he's been talking about the Eucharist, surprisingly enough. And I think it's important that we understand that Paul has talked about the Eucharist because they were coming to the Eucharist in the wrong way. And quite often we find that in the church, many people, they, they have spiritual gifts. They are spiritual people. They have all the opportunity. They have all the potential to do great things for God in the church. And he gives gifts to men and women that we are able to build up the church, which we'll find out in a minute. But he calls us to something which is more important than all of that. And that is the communion. We have become the bride of Christ. That Christ feeds us. Christ protects us. And we become one with Christ as you do in marriage. And so this is what's happening here. That when we come to the Eucharist, Paul is saying, don't be coming to the Eucharist, uh, breaking bread together and gorging yourselves and drinking all the wine and getting drunk. You need to come with reverence and respect and to understand what you're doing here. It's not about you. If you want to be a glutton, go somewhere else. If you don't want to come and take the Eucharist in a worthy manner, go somewhere else. It's quite harsh. But this is what he's saying. Don't take it lightly. And this is not about you. This is about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So you're not just coming to do a memorial service. You're coming to partake of your living God, of the Son of God broken in his body, sacrificing himself so that you could be set free from sin and death. And so that you could live a life of satisfaction in the house of God and in your life generally. But you have to understand what you're doing. You need to come in a worthy manner. You need to see this Eucharist as Christ. It's not you. Forget about all the facts that you haven't done this right and haven't done that. No, that should have been taken care of well before you come to the Eucharist. You should have been thinking about that, you know, the night before, the, the morning. If you had to repent of anything, then repent of it. But coming to the, the Eucharist in a worthy manner is not about that. It's about you. It's about you recognizing the sacrifice of Christ. And this is a sacrifice where his body and blood, the elements, are representing his body and blood. And his presence is there so that when you take it, something happens. And if you don't, you will be sick. If you're taking it in an unworthy manner and you're not recognizing Christ's body and blood as a sacrifice for you, to actually heal you, you will get sick. And it says, and some will die. So not bothering to come to Eucharist is terrible as a believer. We must come to Eucharist. And we must recognize what we're doing and not take it lightly. We must do it reverently and with respect and really understand what we're doing is taking Christ into us so that we can live until the next time we take the Eucharist. And this strengthens our spiritual inner man. If we take the Eucharist correctly, this is, what he's do this is what he's calling us to do. He's called you by name to come and be part of Christ and to be one with him. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. We have to be one with Christ to be in Christ and in the Father. This is important. So when we come down now to the gifts, this is supplementary, but it's also important, of course. But what's the most important thing 
in a service when we meet together. Well, some might say, well, it's the worship, of course, you know, because that breaks the yoke of the evil one. Okay. Prayer, other people say, because, you know, prayer is what moves mountains and helps us to, to live and, and get with God. And other people say, no, 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 it's the word, because you've got to get the word in you to apply the word. You need the word. That's the most important thing. But in actual fact, it's the Eucharist. It's the taking of the bread and the wine together, collectively, as a body of Christ, as the marriage of the bridegroom of Christ comes and makes his home with us. And we, as the bride, respond to that in reverence and respect and submission and humility. And we come before God and recognize all that he's done overwhelms anything that we have done. He covers everything and he gives us everything and he sacrificed his whole life for us. That's the most important. But the gifts are there. He's given us good things. He's blessing us. But if we don't have the Eucharist, the gifts are a waste of time. The word isn't going to have much of an effect on you if you don't respect what Christ has done for you. This is what makes you strong inside, is recognizing the body and blood of Christ, taking it into yourselves in a worthy manner, believing, trusting, expecting. And then verse 12, at verse 1, chapter 12, he says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. So it's suddenly taken on it's still important, but it's not as important as the Eucharist. He says in verse 2, You know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. So he's reminding where we come from. He's talking to the church at Corinth that he planted. And this was the Gentile church. This wasn't the Jews. There'll probably be Jews there, but he's talking to Gentiles generally. He's talking to people. He's talking to church people like you and I non-Jews and he's reminding us that we were in the world that we were following the world's idols trying to get things trying to be successful all those things in the world following the world's wisdom verse four, 3 says therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So this is an important fact, isn't it? Where is your reverence and your respect? It's got to come back to this. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the most important thing to us. The Eucharist is about Jesus. It's not about us, it's about Jesus. So that's where we need to go. And he says, there are diversities of gifts, verse 4, but the same Spirit. So straight away he starts to say to you, there are lots of different gifts. That is to say that if you have a gift, don't get all puffed up and proud because you've got a gift. Don't think that you're better than other people because you've got a gift. There are lots of gifts. And they're all relevant. Verse 5 says there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. So he's saying, look, you... You don't all have to have the same ministry. You know, not everyone is going to be able to be effective in the same role, ministry role, that other people are. We know that God has called people to various ministries, different types of ministries. So this makes us think, well, what ministry has he called me for? What ministry have I got? What ministry will I be called to perform? In what way? There are so many different ways. It could be as a professional in the world. It could be as someone who, who does a laborious job but is, is solid and, and stable and reliable and does a solid job and is able to be a good witness because they're good stewards. 
They look after their families. They do the right things. They are doing an honest day's work. It could be, it could be ministering in terms of teaching, or it could be preaching, or it could be leading worship, or teaching children. It could be evangelism. It could be charitable works, giving, helping people. It could be all manner. Ministries are various. And so, just like the gifts are various, so are the ministries. And it's the same Spirit that gives the gifts. And it's the same Lord who calls you to ministry. Same Spirit, same Lord. Verse 6 says, And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. So no matter what you're doing, you may not necessarily call it a ministry. Some people have said they, they feel called to work with children. Some people have felt they, they've been called to, to work with all sorts of disabilities or, or all manner of things. Some people feel that they are called to just help people physically in nursing or as a doctor or anything. And so th there's so many things other than preaching or teaching the Word of God. There's so many other things. Helps is a gift, we know. But it says, it's the same God who works all in all. So if this is true, if you have a ministry, if, if God's called you to something, he's given you a name, your name represents what your gifting is going to be about. Whatever he calls you to do, it's his calling, it's not yours. And it's the same God that works in your differences as works in other people's differences. So none of us can be proud or puffed up because we feel that we're above someone. Else. You may be called to be a, a prayer warrior. Well, great, but that doesn't mean to say you're any better than anybody else. You're just, that's your ministry. And it, we're all called to be prayer warriors in one respect. And so we've got to be a bit careful that we don't start making people feel a bit puffed up because they're doing a particular thing that's a bit more spiritual than someone else. Giving someone a cup of water in my name, Jesus said, it's as if you did it to me, for me. So, you know, let's not get puffed up because we're doing spiritual things. You may be called to be an officer in the church, a deacon or a priest. You may be called to be a pastor and commissioned to be a pastor and work with a particular church. Whereas a, a, a priest or a deacon is called to the community. Whatever it is, you don't need to get all puffed up because of it. You need to just recognize it's just one of the gifts that God's given you. Don't start thinking of it as you and your gift and what you've accomplished through your gift. That's not right. And verse 6 says, And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God. We've got to remember it's the same God that motivates all of us. Uh, uh, and if we start getting puffed up, then what are we saying to people that are doing other things? We may not be recognizing that God's motivating them as well. We're judging them. We mustn't. Verse 7 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. So we come back to, this is not just for you. The gift is not for you. It's for the profit of all. The gifts are for the upbuilding of the church. You may be really pleased that God's given you a gift of tongues. You may be pleased that God's given you a gift of healings, that you will have times when you can heal people. There is a gift that comes to you at certain times. You may be pleased that God's given you wisdom, a gift of wisdom or, 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 or other things. But it's for the profit of everyone. It's not for you. Verse 8 says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. So for some people, they, they are people that are given some supernatural wisdom so that they seem to have wisdom beyond, can be beyond their years or can be beyond their knowledge, can be beyond their intellect. They could be very simple people, but they have a gift of wisdom that when you go to that person, you know that you're going to get wisdom. 
you're not going to get hairy fairy you're going to get wisdom and you're going to get God's wisdom not the world's wisdom you're not just going to get common sense you're going to get real wisdom that goes way beyond common sense because it's through the spirit to another one he gives the word of knowledge through the same spirit and so you might be someone who is blessed with a great intellect that goes beyond other people to know things you might be able to hold the whole Bible in your brain so that whenever anyone says well what, is I, what did Isaiah do then or what happens in one king you, you've got it there, it's there you've got those words, you, you understand you've got knowledge words of knowledge you can bring words of knowledge so if someone's not sure what verse that was and where that was oh I know that, it's this. I've got that and then sometimes God gives you a word of knowledge over a person's life in a prophetic way. But that's more on the prophecy side. But he might give you a word of knowledge over someone's life. It, it's something that we believe happens from time to time. That he gives you a sense of knowing things. You, you just know stuff. Verse 9 to another, faith. So someone could have a great gift of faith. Now, it doesn't mean to say we've got someone who's just full of faith all the time way above the rest of us you know two meters above the rest of us flying in the air because you've got so much faith or she's got so much faith that nobody could even get near the amount of faith this person's got because they talk faith they have faith and it's just always there but that's not normally true <laughs> because we're weak human beings and it's a gift of faith usually these gifts of faith are faith for certain things now you may have fairly strong faith or you may have shall we say mature faith but we're talking about gifts of faith which is a bit different where you have a gift of faith for a particular thing that sometimes that things come along and people are worried and you just have this faith and know that that's going to be okay And it's something you don't you don't think about it, you just know it. You have that faith. You just trust God for that thing, whatever it is. And it comes at different times for different people. And it can be an ongoing thing to a certain degree, but there are times when it's incredibly important to have that trust and that faith. When things are going wrong around you and when things are going wrong for other people, that you can have that faith and come and say to them, I give you full assurance I have faith for this matter. I really believe this is true. If it's true in you, then that's fine. Unfortunately, we have a lot of people that try to be super spiritual and say, oh yeah, well I have faith you've got this. And they, they're talking out of their backside quite often. They don't really have faith from God. They just decided that, oh yes, I have faith that you're, everything's going to work out for you. And of course, sometimes it doesn't because things need to, to be a certain way. But when you have a gift of faith and it comes from God, there is no doubt in you whatsoever. And, and it's not about spiritual pride. It's about the fact that God has given you that sense of trust in him in that particular situation, which is brilliant. It says, by the same spirit to another gifts of healings by the same spirit. So you may have a gift of healing so that there will be times when you have a gift and people will get healed. We believe it's not quite the same as an anointing, where there's anointing where it, it just is there all the time, but there are times when there are gifts of healings. When, for some strange reason, God has given you a time when you've prayed for someone uh, and something's happened and it's been a real healing taking place. Incredible that Someone has just gained the healing over, it could be on the spot or it could be over time. And it is a gift. There are gifts, different times. I'm not talking about an ongoing. And then it says to another prophecy. Some people can really speak prophetically because God has given them the words and and. They can't deny those words. And this is where we have to be very careful once we start 
saying, thus says the Lord, because we mustn't take the Lord's name in vain. So let's not be frivolous with this gift of prophecy, because there are some people that, that have a prophetic leaning, that we are, some people are very direct and can be, you know, even come across a bit harsh sometimes because they have a very direct prophetic way of being. But prophecy is when God gives you words to say and they've come from God. And usually that kind of prophecy that was there in the Old Testament was to warn the people of God of impending retribution and God would be disciplining them in certain ways. That's what the, the prophets were sent to bring people to turn back to God. And so today we don't need more revelation. We have all the revelation we need in the Word. But there are times when, you know, God will speak through people prophetically. And it's not new revelation. It's just reminding people of what God has said. And speaking something over someone's life can be very important. When we take authority over someone in Christ's name, to do good to people, to be a spiritual, over, to give spiritual oversight, or or be a mentor to someone, you know, we we are not between them and God, but we can speak prophetic words over their life, in a positive way from God, uh, and I don't see anything wrong with that. I think that's something that we can do. We can speak life and health and wholeness because we know God wants to bless people, and we can speak that over someone's life because they are standing for God, they're saying that they're actually following God and, and we can believe God for the good things as well and to see God work in people's lives. And so some people may not agree with some of these things I've said but it's only my experience of, of what I've found as I've been pastoring for, for a number of years and working within the gifts of the Spirit, God has shown me these things and I understood and learned from other people that are working and moving in the Spirit. And this is something that God has shown me. It says also in verse 10 to another, the working of miracles. And so we, we know that Jesus in his hometown could only do, he could only heal the sick. He wasn't able to perform any miracles because they had contempt for him as the, as the carpenter's son. But there are times when we go to other places and people have an expectancy and quite often even miracles happen. Miracle healings, miracle situations that go on and so on. And some people are blessed in that area. Some people are given that as a gift. And then it says, to another discerning of spirits. Well, you may have a, a real discernment. We, we know that our discernment, according to 1 Corinthians, we know our discernment in chapter 2 for 14 it talks about discerning that that the word of god is discerned that that salvation comes from a discerning that happens inside with the holy spirit coming to us and and that the things of god are discerned spiritually they're not something you can work out without a spiritual understanding and so some people have been given the gift to be able to discern spirits that, that come in to the church or spirits that they encounter in people, different types of spirits that are going on in people. You know, there are types of spirits that are pretty obvious and very destructive. For example, the spirit of Jezebel. This is Antichrist. This comes into the church and you see it and you know it and you can feel it. And it is a real antichrist. It, it goes against all authority. It's not submissive. It's totally arrogant. It's, and it wants to destroy. It's always divisive. It wants to break everything up. It wants to destroy the work of God. And you see that spirit of Jezebel. You pick it up pretty quick. And there are other spirits. You know, we, we have so many things going on in the world today. And I think there is a spirit of pornography that that pervades the world today as well. You can see it on the TV and everywhere, really. There is this spirit that just wants us to go chasing pleasure in the flesh. 
And there are all manner of other spirits. We have to discern these. And some people have got the gift to really be dealt with, this, uh, to discern what's happening, where other people are a bit blinded to it. You know, as Christians, we should be awake. We should be watchmen. We should be looking. But sometimes things evade us, even when it talks about the end times where we'll be having to take the mark of the beast or we won't be able to trade or travel. It says even the elect will be deceived at that time. And I believe that's what's happening at the moment. I believe people are being deceived and taken away from God. We've been given the spirit of fear. That's another spirit. And I believe that we should have the spirit of love because love covers a multitude of sins and perfect love drives out fear. So if you have a spirit of fear today, if that's what's going on in you over this whole thing of COVID and vaccines and government control, a digital reset, the great reset coming, everything happening for power to be able to control. This is the world of mammon. We are citizens of heaven. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. So we're in enemy territory. But we shouldn't have a spirit of fear, right? We should be trusting our God for everything. God should be in control of your life, not the spirit of fear. This is where we live. We have to make the distinction. Am I going to be afraid or am I going to trust God? When David stood before Goliath, did he say, hang on a minute, let me put my mask on and, you know, I, I better not get too close to you because I might get some sort of germ. He said the fight is, is the Lord's. As Joshua did when he went into Canaan, the fight is the Lord's. The battle's the Lord's. So there's a sense in which we have to trust God. How big is your God? How big is your trust? How much is your faith? How strong is your faith? And maybe at this time, maybe God has now given me a gift of faith in this area that I do not trust any of this. That I trust God for my well-being. I trust God for my health. I declare God's going to give me health and wholeness and life in this situation. And I declare it in the name of Jesus. And that's what I believe. And I'm not just saying that. I actually do believe that. And so he goes on to say to another different kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. And some people are blessed with understanding languages. But it's, it goes more than just an ordinary talent. It, it, it's, it's like a, a supernatural gift that they are able to discern and understand languages incredibly quickly. And then there's also different kind of tongues in the sense that we we can have the gift of tongues from God as, as a spiritual language that only the Holy Spirit can interpret to the throne of God in our groans and our moans and our utterings and our stammering that God can, can deliver that to the throne of God as, as, as language that God will understand because he created language. And so even though for us it may, it may seem like a weird thing that we're doing when we're talking in tongues or praying in tongues we know that this is something God has given us but we don't do that in a in a in a group situation in an assembly to do that without someone interpreting what we're saying and that's where the other thing comes into another the interpretation of tongues so there may be people in in a fellowship that that have the gift of tongues and if there's someone there that can interpret, then that's fine. But if there's not, then they need to be quiet in the congregation. That's what we're told. Verse 11 says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things. It's one Spirit. Don't get above yourself because God's given you a gift. Don't start to get proud and puffed up because you have a gift that perhaps nobody else in the church has at that time. And the other thing, always be prepared to give way to an angel that comes into the church, whether you're the pastor, minister, preacher, worship leader, an officer in the church, a deacon, a priest, a pastor. Well, always be prepared to give way when you see someone else's gift. Don't be jealous. Don't be envious because you don't have that gift. 
realize it's to build you up. It's not something to be resentful about or to try and subdue or put down or criticize. One and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So that's what we're taught. So we need to make way for gifts coming into the church. There's nothing worse than being in a small fellowship where everyone's doing certain things and everyone's got their, their job and their, their place where they're going and then someone else comes in that has been given a supernatural gift or has been is really committed and God has really done a work in that person and they're, they're ready to serve, they're, they're willing, they're able and then someone is envious of that, someone doesn't like that, someone gets upset because, well, that was my job. Uh, and, and there's room for everybody, we can all do these things. So if someone comes in, great, then someone can give you a rest while you do something else. It's not a problem. We shouldn't be envious or jealous or have a problem with anyone coming in. I would love to see someone come in that, that has a gift of preaching. And I always encourage people to learn to teach and preach from the Word of God and bring their, their wisdom that God's given them. And that would be great for me to, to be able to sit and receive instead of having to give all the time. To just be able to receive occasionally would be great. So I, I'm never worried about someone coming in. Maybe because I'm older, perhaps I'm ready to step aside and let someone you know, show us their metal and see what God's doing through them and it can be great and I encourage that and I want to teach people to use those gifts. We should eagerly seek those gifts we're told. And so that's great as far as I'm concerned. When someone comes into the church has gotten it, great, let's let's make room for that person. Let's give them something to do. Let's, you know, take turns. Yeah, let's do something. Let's teach and let's get moving. This is really important. The gifts are there for us, but don't lose sight of why we're really here. It's the fact that we are taking part in the sacrifice of Christ and He is the one that we come to that will really help us to move forward and to live our lives as, as believers. <laughs>